Thank you, everybody, for taking the time out of your schedule to join me today. My name is Adam Killian, and I'll be presenting on the newly updated fourth edition to the ANSI B1119. Now, I won't just be focusing on what has changed, but also how you can take advantage of the updated standards so that you don't view this as a burden of just another update that you'll have to become familiar with, not to mention all those new requirements, but more of a benefit to how this can help you. So before I get started, I just wanted to make note that as many of us are required to stay at home, I'm no exception. With that said, I've kicked the kids off of all streaming services in hopes that my internet won't flake out. Now, any of you that have kids know where I'm going with this. So if you hear screaming, fighting, the sound of punches, or basically World War III, just try to do your best to ignore it. And also, if you have any questions during this presentation, please feel free to add them to the chat window on the right and I'll do my best to answer these at the end of the presentation. And don't worry, the chat window is private, so only I can see the questions. So a little bit about myself. I'm a safety specialist with Grand Tech Systems, and I've been um, with the company for just about four years. As Grand Tech is part of the B11 Accredited Standards Committee, I've been excited to be part of it as well. I've been in the industry for just under 25 years, with the bulk of my career focusing on hardware design and industrial controls. In about the last 10 years, I've dedicated it to industrial safety with a strong focus on machine safety. So what that means is that I'm down in the trenches with those of you out there who are performing risk assessments, responsible for machine safety upgrades, do safety site audits, lockout tag out. Basically, if you wear a safety hat of some kind, I'm right there with you. So for today's agenda, when I was putting this presentation together, I thought to myself, well, if I were in the audience, what would I want to know? And that's really how I decided on the material that I'll be presenting. Now, this presentation is really meant as a cursory overview, as we won't have time to go over all the changes. But my intent is that by the end of this presentation, you won't feel as though you need to read the standard, but that you'll want to read the standard. Of course, I'm sure a bulk of you are here today because you're curious about the updates to the B1119, and I'm glad you are, because it's not just a few modifications or an addition to an annex here and there. This is a full, unequivocal overhaul of the standard. And coming from somebody who uses this on a regular basis, my hat is off to all those who are part of the writing committee and experts in the industry, as this is one of the most complete, well-organized, and thorough standards, period. So first off, we want to make sure that everybody is on the same page with the understanding of what's required as an employer. And therefore, we'll briefly discuss the basic regulations. Then we'll move into demonstrating compliance by showing that we've met the requirements and made the machine safe. We'll then take a little stroll down the history of the B11 with an aim to answer the question of, why do I even need this standard? Let alone, why would I want to comply with it? Now. For those of you who are familiar with the 2010 edition, we'll go over one of the more dramatic changes, and that is the restructuring of the risk reduction measures. We'll then highlight the additions and updates to the standard, and we'll answer the question of, okay, so where to from here? I mean, now that I have a general understanding of the updates to the B1119, now what? And with that said, let's get started. Now, when the United States established the minimum requirements for safety, the Occupational Health and Safety Administration was created, also known as OSHA. And since 1971, in terms of machine guarding, it hasn't changed a whole lot. That means that these regulations are 49 years old. I would hope that everyone would agree that a lot has changed in the past 49 years, especially in terms of technology and the methods of protecting people with that technology. So in terms of machine guarding, what are the requirements? Well, if we look at how the regulations for machine safeguarding is organized, it has two sections which apply to all machines. The 1910-212, which are the general requirements for all machinery, and the 1910-219, which applies to gears, belts, pulleys. It's basically the powertrain of your machine. The rest are machine specific. And in today's market, there are a lot more diverse machines than what's listed here. This means that for most manufacturers, we only use these two regulations, the 212 and the 219. So the quickest way to sum up the requirements of these two is that 
It's the employer's responsibility to protect the employees from hazards created by machinery. Basically, discard the hazard so you can't get hurt. I mean, that sounds pretty easy. Said nobody ever. Especially when you think about today with the amount of diverse technologies and the complexities that come with it. And that's where industry consensus standards step in. Now, these standards help take the guesswork out of determining what's right, or more importantly, what did I do wrong? And more than anything, these standards are what the industry has agreed on to be the best method or solution for a particular topic. In addition, standards make it a lot easier to demonstrate compliance to the regulations. So in general, I found it easiest to break the standards into the following categories. This is our way of grouping standards into how they best make sense. So first off, you have assessment standards, which make sure you identify and remediate hazards appropriately. You take, uh, you can think of these as more of a process that you follow. Complete a risk assessment, select a risk reduction measure, and determine if it's sufficient. If not, rinse and repeat. You have product standards which give you confidence that safety devices and technologies are fail safe and designed properly. Basically, when you buy a safety device, you wanna be assured that it was designed and built correctly. We have application standards, which ensure that safety devices and technologies are applied, installed and used properly. This is how you know you mounted the light curtain at that correct safe distance or wired that safety circuit correctly. We have performance standards that ensure all safety systems and the devices that are connected together are designed to still work even in the event of a failure. And finally, we have validation standards, which make sure all the pieces are put together properly to ultimately reduce the risk. Now, out of all these standards, there are only two that are highlighted red, and these are the two of interest for this presentation, the B110 and the B1119. And one other note in this area before we move on is that there is very little that's completely new in the industry, especially when you consider that there are over 700 international standards. But what's new to the US audience is pulling from these international standards to create a, well, as Gandalf would say, one standard to rule them all. The B1119 is designed to make it easier and simpler to manage the application of risk reduction measures through a single standard, not to mention its cost effectiveness as well. Now, the main standard that we're talking about today is the B1119. However, before I dive into that topic, I just wanna to touch on the ANSI B110 because these two standards are very intermingled as you work towards making your machine safe. You could think of them as the Wonder Twins, you know, the superheroes from the Justice League, the Justice League that was on Saturday morning cartoons in the 70s. <sighs> All right. Nonetheless, we termed the ANSI B11-0 uh, in the previous slide as an assessment standard. So Zan here takes on the form of a process by how you go about estimating and evaluating risk. It's the standard that helps you identify hazards and come up with a solution to ensure that the risk reduction measures that you choose are appropriate to reduce the risk to an acceptable level. On the flip side, you could think of the ANSI B1119 as a reference guide or an encyclopedia of sorts. So Jaina here is in the shape of an application that once you pick your risk reduction measure from the B110, you can ensure it's used properly with the B1119. Without it, how do you know if that system is wired correctly or the guarding is installed properly? How do you know if that light curtain is tall enough or what about the gap in that guard over there? Is it too large? Without this standard, you're on your own to answer these questions. And between you and me, that is a very unsettling feeling. So just remember that these two standards are almost always used together. For somebody who might work in machine safety, an integrator OEM, these are two standards that should guide you through the risk reduction process. Even though we're only going to talk about the B1118, I wanted you to be aware of how connected it is to the B110. And if you don't have a copy of it, it wouldn't be a bad idea to get one. 
Now, ANSI B1119 came about due to new technologies that were entering the market and people wanted to make sure that they were using these safety devices correctly. If you think about it, before they were electronic safety devices, they were mainly just guards. But then all of a sudden there was this flood of electronic devices in a short amount of time in the 80s. And as a result, this standard was created to help people know how to properly implement those devices. Hence, this standard came about from a need in the industry. Work began in 1980, but it took about 10 years for the first release. The standard was very well received, and in 1996, it was simply reaffirmed, which means that it was accepted without change. Now, in 2003, there was a major rewrite to include anthropomorphic data, which is basically a fancy word for the measurements and proportions of the human body, along with a new safety distance annex. Then we had our third edition in 2010, which is probably the current version that most of you are familiar with. One of the most notable changes from the 2003 edition was the heavy emphasis on the risk assessment by linking it to the new ANSI B110 that was released in 2008. And this takes us to our fourth edition. Now this isn't just some major rewrite, this was a complete overhaul. And at this point, we should be asking ourselves, why? A complete overhaul. And well, a couple reasons. First, new technologies simply outpace the previous revision. We have to remember that this is an application standard, and as such, it needs to keep up with the changes in technology. So it's not surprising that as technology increases, the standard will require updates. Secondly, these new technologies didn't fit in well with the current structure, and that drove the need for a redesign of the standard. So the writing committee basically started with a blank piece of paper, and by doing so, it gave them a lot of freedom in regards to how the document was laid out. A few notable changes to the standard are that the document has increased from 122 pages to 255 pages. Now, instead of perceiving this as more red tape and more requirements to meet, you should see this as more guidance in today's market. I can tell you as a user of the standard, it made my life simpler, easier, and faster. There are a significant amount of new technologies added. This means one thing, you can do more stuff. And who doesn't want to do more stuff? The annex is increased by over 350%, which means a lot more detailed instruction on how to ensure your designs comply with the standard. And finally, the first few sections of the document didn't really change, but beyond that, the meat of the document has been restructured to align with the concept of the hierarchy of control in the B110. And this is something worth discussing for a minute. Now the table on the left is what is called the hierarchy of control. It's laid out in such a way as to describe the effectiveness of risk reduction measures from most effective to least effective. This can be found again in the ANSI B110, um, but as a note, this process of risk reduction is also called the three-step process as stated in the ISO 12100. So following that line of thought, step one is inherently safe by design. Step two is engineering controls, also known as safeguarding and complementary measures. And step three, administrative controls or information for use. And we'll discuss each of these sections in more detail in the upcoming slides. Now, since the B110 standard is structured in a manner with how risk reduction measures are laid out, it only made sense for the B1119 to align with it. So if we look at step one, all risk reduction measures that would be considered inherently safe by design are grouped into their own clause. The same goes for engineering controls, but they're grouped into three distinctive clauses to align with their function. They are guards, control functions, and devices. And finally, the third step is administrative controls, and they're also grouped together in their own clause. So this structuring of the B1119 does a couple of things. First, as mentioned, it aligns better with the ANSI B110. When you decide on a risk reduction measure as maybe an engineering control or administrative control, you can quickly jump to the B1119 knowing that engineering controls are in clauses eight through 10 and administrative controls are in clause 11. Which brings me to my second point. 
it's much faster to find what you're looking for. This document is laid out in a much more intuitive manner so that finding things are quicker and easier. The bottom line is that because you can be more efficient, this means you have more time for other things like uh, an extra coffee break or depending on how fast you become around a golf. I mean, it's up to you. So now with all that said, let's dive into the document. So to play in the last slide, um, this is maybe a more readable version of the B1119 structure when it comes to the hierarchy of controls. And all the sections that are being highlighted are either new content or additional information that has been added to the existing sections. This should give you an idea of why the document has increased by 133 pages. When you see all these new updates and additions to the standard, you might see this as a cost increase, but I see this as a cost savings. Many of these areas have aligned with existing national and international standards. And what that means is that there is a good chance that you won't have to purchase another standard in order to implement your risk reduction measure. For instance, let's say that you had an in-running NIP hazard that you needed to guard. The 2010 edition didn't have any guidance on this. So you had a couple of choices. You could ignore it and hope nobody gets hurt, try to figure it out yourself, or purchase an applicable standard with the information needed on guarding an in-running NIP. And that costs money. Not only does this save in purchasing a library of standards, but it also saves money in your designs. For example, with the updates to the inherently safe by design, it's possible that you could eliminate a guard using this section on maximum gaps by designing out the hazard or creating a process from the assistance of prevention by design. With the new control functions, you could have your machine be more efficient through monitoring of safe speeds. And with administrative controls, you now have more content with everything from information to use to PPE. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I don't have time to go over all the changes. So mainly I'm gonna focus on the addition of new sections and touch on any changes that I felt were substantial or worth mentioning. So how about we start from the beginning with inherently safe by design. The definition of inherently safe by design comes directly from the ANSI B110 standard, and it reads, a design measure that reduces risk, which is not susceptible to malfunction that will increase the risk of harm. Now, this can be done in a couple of ways from simply eliminating the pinch points, redesigning the process, or to remove the human interaction altogether. A couple quick examples of this are, mm, let's say that you're using a hazardous chemical. Well, if you have the ability to replace it with a non-hazardous chemical, you've now made the process safe by design. Or let's say there's a hazard above your head, but it's unreachable from the walking surface from where you stand. Then it's in, uh, inherently safe by design. So now that we have an understanding of what it is, let's discuss the new addition to the standard. The first new section is prevention through design. The standard states that they are design changes to how a task is performed or the nature of the hazard shall be identified and implemented to reduce risk by eliminating or reducing exposure to the hazard where feasible. Now, I find this to be a great addition. I've actually worked with companies where they didn't want to incorporate safety to the end or maybe halfway through the design. They simply didn't want to redo their stage gate process or in general, let's be honest, Engineering just didn't want to be bothered with it. Sadly, the safety aspect is usually an afterthought. Then, when it's determined that there's a hazard that needs to be guarded, it's done as quickly and inexpensively as possible. Which reminds me of that saying, good, fast, cheap. I mean, pick two because you can't have them all. So if you're going to do something quickly and inexpensively, what won't you get? You guessed it. It probably won't be good. The end products are controls that can be cumbersome, production killers, and overall not as effective as they could if you just designed out the hazard altogether. But by improve, uh, involving safety as soon as possible in the design phase, preferably even as early as the design concept phase, with the addition of performing the risk assessments throughout the process, you have a greater opportunity to incorporate safety into your design possibly eliminating the hazard from the process altogether instead of adding engineering and administrative controls after the fact. This can also significantly reduce the cost of the design. 
A general rule of thumb is that a change during the design phase that would cost a dollar will cost $10 during the fabrication process and $100 during construction. So it only makes sense to have safety involved as soon as possible. And this added concept to the standard just might give you the horsepower to get your safety involved earlier in your design cycle. Now, minimum crushing can be very useful depending on the application. It's a new addition to the ANSI B1119, but it's aligned with an existing international standard. These are gaps that are intended to avoid crushing of specific parts of the human body. Let's say that you have a reciprocating table that moves horizontally left and right. On the right side, there's a wall. The concern is that somebody were to stand between the wall and the table, they could get injured when the table moves to the right towards the wall. Positioning the table so that the maximum stroke is approximately 20 inches from the wall will comply with the minimum gap to avoid crushing, and therefore, it's inherently safe by design. As another example, I was performing a risk assessment on a product diverter. Um, it has a guide rail that pivots inward towards the middle of the conveyor to push product onto a different downstream conveyor. In this instance, it wasn't possible to guard the pinch point that the guide rail made with the fixed rail when moving in and out. And it was possible to squeeze your hand in there. But with the concept of minimum gaps to avoid crushing, we were able to increase the gap between the fixed rail and the movable rail to four inches. So even if you squeezed your hand in that area, it wouldn't get hurt. During the access, uh, assessment phase, I used an international standard because at the time, the B1119 had no information on this. Another new addition to the standard is maximum gaps. Now, this one is rather straightforward. Basically, when the opening to the hazard exceeds six millimeters, or for all intent and purposes, a quarter inch, the risk reduction measure is no longer considered inherently safe by design, and appropriate engineering controls should be used. The last part of what I just said is very important to understand. Appropriate engineering controls should be used. This means, for example, if you added a fixed guard to protect a hazard, you have implemented an engineering control, and therefore that hazard does not fall into step one, inherently safe by design. Now, this doesn't mean there's anything wrong with adding a guard, but just to understand that it's now an engineering control, and as such, should follow any requirements for inspection and maintenance. One nugget of information to note is that even though the B1119 has aligned with the ISO 13857 standard, which is where the concept of maximum gaps has been pulled from, there are a few differences, and this area is one of those differences. OSHA states, the allowable opening without setback is six millimeters, as does the B1119, but ISO only allows four millimeters. Now the stance from the B1119 is that both give similar results in reducing the risk. But if you're designing to comply with ISO, you would wanna meet the requirements of four millimeters. And don't worry, you don't need to memorize that information as it's mentioned in the explanatory section of the B1119. And this moves us into engineering controls. It should probably go without saying that these controls, being that they are the second step in the three-step process, means that they're not as effective as inherently safe by design, simply because they don't eliminate the hazards, but rather isolate people from the hazard via guards or lower the level of risk to an acceptable level through safety functions and devices. Well-designed engineering controls can be highly effective in protecting workers with uh, and will typically be independent of worker interaction to provide a sufficient level of protection. The B1119 has made great strides in this area of engineering controls with alignment with many key national and international standards, along with significant work in the area of control functions. So the first section that we'll be discussing is guards. Guards are one of the most applied risk reduction measures. They are your first line of defense against injuries caused by machine operation. With the latest addition and the amount of information supplied in the annexes, I have found this section to be one of the most valuable. Now, the reason I don't have time to go over all the additions and updates is simply because of the amount of new information. The annexes alone for guarding is over 17 pages, which is 23% of the technical information in all the annexes. Now, 
When you think of movable guards, maybe the first thing that you think of is an interlocked door. In the revised standards, there have been added clarification to definitions, and this being one of them. Now, because of the restructuring of the standard, there was a need to separate guards and devices. So if you were to have a movable guard with an interlock, uh, it is now considered an interlock guard. This might not seem earth shattering, but what it did was allow separating the individual parts into their own section of the standard, such as guards and control devices. This then allowed for the acknowledgement of two things. First, an immovable guard can reduce the risk without an interlocking device, as long as it uses fasteners requiring a tool, and that if fasteners or interlocks are not feasible, it could be categorized as an awareness barrier or a shield. The next addition to the standard is self-adjusting guards, but honestly, this is a minor addition as it's very similar to adjustable guards, except for the fact that adjustable guards require manual adjustment and self-adjusting guards are, well, you guessed it, automatic. So we'll just jump to the next section, perimeter guarding. By definition, a perimeter guard is used to define the boundary of a safeguarded space. This, of course, is probably one of the most recognizable risk reduction measures in the industry, which is one reason this section was so welcomed as it added new specifications around reach over, reach through, and most excitedly, reach under. And for guidance on this, the updated annex is 11 pages, which is the second largest behind the reaching distance uh, for devices. Now, there are two notable uh, changes to the previous edition of the B1119 that affect reach over and reach through. In regards to reach over, there is now a minimum perimeter guard height of 55 inches, where the previous edition had a reference of 39 inches. Also, the previous edition had two separate tables for reach over titled low risk and high risk. The difficulty that I always had with those tables was how do you determine low or high risk? Many times that classification would even fit into your risk assessment scoring. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've not had a risk scoring table of just low and high. Usually you have intermediate steps, negligible, slight, uh, moderate, major. So to avoid lengthy discussions debating if the hazard is low or high, I would just usually default to the high risk table. The stance now from the B1119 committee is that if you can reach a hazard, whether it hurts a little or hurts a lot, you shouldn't be able to reach it. So they remove the low risk table. What that means is that if you've been using the high risk table for reach over, well, then you're good to go. Now with reach through, the standard has aligned with the ISO 13857. And that means that for slot openings, the new standard is more restrictive with respect to distance to the hazard. Basically, your setback from the guard to the hazard has increased. For square openings, the fingertip has become a little more restrictive, but finger, hand, and arm are less restrictive. This is definitely something you're going to want to take note of in your upcoming designs. There's also guidance for round openings, and they also included information on reaching through a guard with limited movement. Now, in my opinion, Reach Under is one of the most notable additions to the guarding portion of the standard. Guidance surrounding this was about as elusive as Bigfoot. Most people had a rule of thumb of 12 inches, and then over the years, it was decreased to seven inches. But the question was always, where exactly is this coming from? The B1119 2010 edition was silent on this, which then meant that the hunt was on to find the requirement, if any, for Reach Under. Now, if you've been doing this for as long as I have, you might remember that the 1999 edition of the robot standard had a maximum height from the walking surface to the bottom of the guard of 12 inches. But that standard was replaced with the now 2012 edition and the maximum height requirement was removed and left with a note, basically a Dear John letter stating to refer to the ISO 13857. This of course meant the purchase of yet another standard for just reach under. The bigger problem here is that even in the 13857, there was no specific reference to reach under. You kind of had to extrapolate that full body access was seven inches. So I guess I shouldn't have a gap larger than seven inches from the walking surface to the bottom of my perimeter guard. And to go one step further, when given a maximum limit, 
People just usually default to that. I mean, case in point, speed limits. So if a standard says that the maximum allowable gap is seven inches, most guarding would just default to seven inches, whether that was the proper height for risk reduction or not. The 2019 edition gives substantial guidance on reaching under a guard, and it now states that the maximum gap from the walking surface to the bottom of the guard shall be no greater than seven inches. Finally, but also clarifies that if a hazard can be reached under a guard with a gap of seven inches, then the gap must be decreased. And a standard gives information on determining that maximum opening as well. Now, as somebody who comes across nit points from time to time, it's always been a bit tricky on exactly how to guard the hazard. The previous edition of the B1119 didn't have any information, and unless you had access to a standard to discuss risk reduction measures specific to nit points, which are mainly found in the printing industry, then you're left with OSHA 1910-219 and sad trombone, because we all know OSHA pretty much leaves it up to the employer to determine how to make it safe. So then you had to figure it out yourself. The addition of requirements to nip guards in the standard, along with five pages of guidance through annex material, relieves the pressure of anxiety of feeling as though you need to either dole out money for another standard that you most likely didn't need except for one small section or just make it up on the fly. Now, the takeaway from the guard section of the engineering controls is that the B1119 standard will give you better alignment to other well-published standards along with incorporating that information so that you don't have to purchase them. Not to mention creating more consistent designs through better guidance on guarding. And now we move to control functions, which is one of the largest additions to the standard. There have been nine new or updated sections with a lot of exciting new content. My goal in this section of control functions is to touch on some of the new additions that I felt were notable and most beneficial when it comes to optimizing efficiency uh, through your safety designs. Now, control functions are part of the machine control system that are assigned to provide safety functions that are therefore called the safety-related parts of the control system. Now, these safety functions can consist of hardware and software and can either be separate from the machine control or an integral part of it. They are basically your inputs from your safety devices, such as an interlock or light curtain, that are wired to the logic device that make the decisions of what to do with the input and then wired to the output device that would be affected by the decision. In other words, if an interlock guard door is open, then tell the logic device that the door is open, and the logic device will then stop the hazardous motion with the output device. So this would be considered a safety function, more specifically, a safety function that's initiating a safe condition. So the first of the added control functions is monitoring functions. These are probably one of the more useful functions as they monitor safety related processes or machine conditions. As an example, you could use a monitoring function for jogging at a safety rated speed using an encoder or proximity sensor mounted to the drive shaft of the machine and wired to a safety speed module to determine machine speed. If the speed should exceed the maximum safe speed, then remove power to the hazard. Now I'm sure many of you knew that and generally in the industry, this is nothing new at all. But what is new that I'm excited to mention is the inclusion of safe condition functions for drives. Safe torque off or STO as many of us call it has been around for a while and many of you are probably using it now. But how many of you are using safe limited speed built into a drive so that you don't have to mount an encoder or prox switches to your machine to feedback to the safety speed module. It's all done within a drive. Or what about safe stop two, also known as safe operating stop, which is basically a category two stop. After a controlled deceleration to stop, the drive will remain powered to hold the position within a defined range. Now you don't have to power it on your drive for a safe condition. Usually when you did, after a reset, you could potentially wait minutes for all the drives to come back online. This could be a dramatic efficiency boost to your machine. 
And all of these safe condition functions are part of Annexel, uh, the safety uh, functions for power drive systems. Now, when I was first introduced to this concept of span of control, I found it difficult to understand how it was different from zoning of a machine. I mean, after all, isn't the zone of a machine considered the span of control that the zone has in that area to the overall larger system? And I guess you could say that, but what I had to understand that span of control is not just an engineering solution, but even more awareness. So let me explain. Zoning is about segmenting your control system. It's about taking one large system and breaking it into smaller chunks for different safety functions. A good example of this would be taking a robot cell and breaking it into two different control zones. There would be no reason to stop the entire robot cell if while in one area, you don't have access to the other area. Therefore, you would zone the machine so that when entering one area, you would remove the hazardous motion while the other area would continue to function. Span of control, on the other hand, is solving the problem of having awareness of the system. It's about the knowledge of the device that's connected to the safety function. Meaning, if you press the e-stop, is it gonna stop the hazard 75 feet down the line or just the hazard in front of you? This concept becomes even more important when you have multiple machines tied together working in a coordinated manner. Does the e-stop remove power to the machine I'm standing in front of or all the machines? So I look at span of control as a design consideration from an engineering standpoint with regards to your production line or your integrated manufacturing platform. But I also look at it as administrative controls for training. And this is a new concept for the B1119. Your employees need to be aware of what the span of control is and how the safety functions react to the system. If they have better understanding, then they can be more efficient with how they interact with their machine. So just a couple quick notables in this section before we move to devices. In regards to performance, this section is heavily focused on component failures and how the safety function should react to such a failure. This is in regards to the use of devices such as safety relays along with the application software. And there is a normative reference to validation of the safety functions, including the documentation of the validation. For stop functions, they have been divided into three distinct classes of normal stop, which is simply your general machine stop, protective stop, which are initiated manually or automatically, uh, such as tripping a light curtain, and emergency stops, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. With Safety related reset. The 2010 edition didn't have a specific subclause for manual or automatic reset. It was heavily mentioned throughout the standard, but it was up to you to piece together how to best reset your safety functions. The 2019 edition brings more clarity around automatic and manual reset with explanatory notes uh, discussing the specifics of line of sight for reset to the use of multiple resets. Now, much of this uh, shouldn't be new to you, but it's nice to have it consolidated into one section. A good amount of work went into safe distance, which is mainly found in the annexes that I'll be going over in the next section. But besides that, there is a requirement to document the safe distance calculations, how to deal with safe distance stop times when they increase, and no surprise, basically don't use the machine until a safe distance has been reestablished, and the use of safe distance monitoring devices to monitor that the stop time of the machine is within a window of what was determined to be safe. Now, in regards to presence sensing, the section on PSDI or presence sensing device initiation, well, really not a lot has changed, but it is now required to document the safe distance calculations, schematics, the software, maintenance checks. And I will say, that the new edition does have more requirements around documenting risk reduction measures, but this should be looked at as a good thing as documentation is going to drive consistency. Now there is also presence sensing using the concept of device monitored perimeter risk reduction. And this requires that the area defined by the perimeter must be able to sense intrusion at all times. Otherwise it's considered whole body access. So what this means is that if you trip a light curtain by leaning into a machine, that light curtain should detect you the entire time that you're leaning into the machine.
But if you're able to crawl into the machine and the light curtain can no longer detect you, then it's considered whole body access, which is a perfect segue. The 2010 edition of the B1119 just had a handful of references to whole body access, uh, and it was referred to as full body access or pass through. Yet in the 2019 edition, there are over 46 distinct references. Basically, if a risk reduction measure allows for whole body access, then additional measures should be applied to maintain acceptable risk. Now, if you're wondering how do you do that, well, there are 11 pages of normative and explanatory information, along with the fact that whole body access is basically baked into a bulk of the annexes. The last portion of the engineering controls are devices. The update to the standard has the least impact in this area, but the biggest in the annex portion. The standard has finally incorporated trap keys. This was another of those elusive Bigfoot categories. Heck, trap keys might be as old as Bigfoot, but ANSI didn't have much to say about it until now. And the B1119 has roughly four pages of normative and explanatory requirements on the topic. Present sensing is one of those sections that existed in 2010 edition with information on areas such as light curtains, laser scanners, and safety mats. But one new technology that was added is vision-based systems. Now this is very new to the industry and the B1119 understands that and basically established minimum requirements so that when it's fully matured, the standard is ready to incorporate it. Now, in my opinion, more importantly than these last two editions, well, except trap keys, because that was well needed. <laughs> are the updates to the annexes in relation to present sensing devices. As the largest grouping of all the annex, this is one area that I could probably spend half a day discussing, but I only have time to review a couple of the additions. The alignment of the B1119 with the ISO 13855, in my opinion, is a huge improvement to the previous edition in regards to the requirements of reaching over a vertical sensing field, similar to the requirements of reaching under a perimeter guard that I spoke about earlier. The previous edition was vague at best with the concept that if the top beam of the light curtain was between 36 and 48 inches in height, it was considered a reach over. And therefore you had a depth penetration factor of 48 inches with your arm. But what if the light curtain was 55 inches from the walking surface? Is it no longer a reach over? I mean, I can obviously reach over it. And if I can, do I still need to comply with the 48 inch depth penetration factor? What about 70 inches from the walking surface? So you can see how this was difficult to use, let alone keeping consistency with your designs. The 2019 edition incorporates a reach over table similar to that of perimeter guarding which gives specific requirements to the height of the top beam of the light curtain and the amount of depth penetration at that height. Another area of improvement is the addition of reaching under a vertical sensing field with respect to the hazard. The 2010 edition wasn't completely silent on this as it did reference maximum height from the walking surface of 12 inches. But what did we say about giving people maximum values? they'll most likely just default to that. Now, the maximum height from the walking surface in the 2019 edition remains at 12 inches, but that's what the understanding that if you were to reach under the light curtain, you can't make contact with the hazard. If you can, then there are requirements for restricting the maximum height of the bottom beam from the walking surface to avoid access to the hazard. Another annex related to present sensing devices deals with system performance to achieve a safe condition. Or simply put, how long does it take for the hazardous motion to stop? Now, I'm not going to lie to you. The requirements in this area for determining stop times is definitely more complex with requiring 10 stop time values and calculating the mean value of plus or minus three standard deviations. The good part is that the annex is very well written with sample calculations to assist you. So they don't leave you in the dust scrambling to find your old stats and probability book. <laughs> Basically, use the sample they give, replace their values with yours, and you're good to go. Other notable additions to the annex are reaching over a vertical sensing field with an additional protective structure, 
reaching under a vertical sensing field with a protective structure, foot actuated controls, reaching through a movable guard before a safety device trips, and safety edge and bumper devices. Now that's some good looking information. This should give you just an idea of what's in the over 23 pages of reference material. And this moves us into step three, administrative controls. There are several added sections which include awareness means, information for use, supervision, control of hazardous energy, and PPE. These were written for general guidance and basically to align better with the B110 for risk reduction measures. So as the slide states, administrative controls can bring awareness to a hazard through training, policies and procedures, or PPE that lessen the threat of a hazard to an individual. But you must remember that all of those require interaction of the person. You're not removing the hazard, but changing how people interact with the environment. Because the effectiveness is so dependent on the behavior of the individual, it's what I like to say is the last line of defense. Administrative controls by themselves might not be very effective to lessening the hazard, but combining them with engineering controls can make for a well-rounded risk reduction process. Now, awareness means is not new to the B1119. Clause 9 of the 2010 edition was awareness barriers, signals, and signs. But what has been added is awareness markings. And in consideration that one of OSHA's top violations is walking and working surfaces, this is a welcomed addition. And furthermore, there is an annex for this as well. And if you haven't figured it out by now, some of my favorite additions to this standard are the annexes, and this one is no exception. The annex is broken into three areas for signals, signs, and markings. For signs, the B1119 aligns with the ANSI Z535, which shouldn't be of any surprise, with the use of signal words, safety symbols, and color coding. For signals, the B1119 aligns with the NFPA 79 in regards to indicator colors, but it also goes one step further with a table for alternate colors, which can be used when agreed on with the supplier and user. And for safety markings, since there is no known regulation or consensus standard that exists to specifically address safety markings, the B1119 took guidance from several ANSI and OSHA standards to support the information for everything from color selection based on intended purpose to the recommended aisle marking width. Now, this might not sound like a significant addition to the standard when you consider all the other sections we've discussed. That is, of course, until you need it. I mean, I've not memorized the recommended guidance on the proper color to use for a particular awareness marking for a specific purpose. I'm sure if I did enough Google searches or dug through a pile of standards, I could find it. But the B1119 has all that information at your fingertips. How many of you know the recommended width of an aisle marking? I'll admit I didn't, but the annex will answer that for you. How about the correct signal word to use for an awareness sign or the color that aligns with that signal word? Well, you guessed it, just check the annex. And that takes us to our next section, information for use. Oh, oh, oh and oh, by the way, um, the recommended width of an aisle marking is between two and six inches. Now, when it comes to writing a procedure for training, staring at a blank screen with a blinking cursor is at times very daunting. That feeling of where in the world do I even begin? What information should be included? How should the form look? Do I need to track the revision? Well, this section gives a high level overview of areas such as instruction manuals, safe work procedures, training, and inspection and maintenance. Now, this is not an exhaustive breakdown with example procedures or generic forms, but more of what information should be expected to be part of the document. Although it does give reference to other standards for more information regarding these areas, including sample forms that can be found in the ANSI B110. Just another reason to get your hands on a copy of that standard. Another area added is supervision. Proper training and supervision are essential to the implementation of methods used to reduce risk to individuals. The B1119 gives guidance for supervision of the workplace, including an exhaustive list of unauthorized changes that could increase risk. And if you were looking for how to stop unauthorized changes, well, look no further. The standard includes that as well. And if there is one thing that I've learned over the years, it's that change is inevitable. 
So it's a good thing that management of change was also part of this section. And it includes what should be part of a change document and verification and validation requirements to risk reduction changes. The control of hazardous energy might be new to the B1119, but it by no means is new to the industry. I'm sure we're all aware of it. The purpose of the addition was to better align with the B110 as a risk reduction measure. And finally, the last section is personal protective equipment. There isn't much to be said here other than the addition of PPE to the standard is validating that uh, it's a means for risk reduction. So what does all this mean? Well, for starters, it means you can standardize. Whether you're an OEM, integrator, or end user, you can standardize better. And what does that get you? More consistency. The last thing you want with safety is to have two different safety solutions on two identical machines and not even know it. And worst off, can't explain it. So standardization helps with your compliance to OSHA. As an example, we did a study on six brand new machines that came into a plant and found that even though all the e-stops on the machines were compliant per NFPA 79, all six machines did something different when you push their e-stop. Now, how difficult is that for you as a company to manage when the e-stops don't function the same? I mean, at a minimum, you would need different training procedures for each machine, separate use documents, different zoning specification placards, not to mention the concern of the operators forgetting what machine they were working on and pressing an e-stop expecting one action and getting another. Your risk level just ratcheted up a few notches. Bottom line, standardize. Another takeaway is that you can do more stuff. With the new technologies added to the standard, it tells you how to implement those risk reduction measures correctly so that you can feel confident in your designs. And something that I've mentioned several times throughout this presentation is that with all these new technologies, you have the ability to optimize efficiency. With these newly included technologies, instead of locking out your machine or even completely stopping it to perform a particular task, what about pausing it? Or better yet, slowing it down to a safe speed to perform the task. This way the machine can continue to produce while the task is being performed. So in a nutshell, you shouldn't be looking at this standard as 133 new pages of compliance. You should be looking at this as you can do more stuff and do it more efficiently. So where to from here? Well, first off, I would encourage you to get your hands on a copy. But once you have it, well, then what? Well, if you're a safety person, I'd wait till you have a piece of equipment to upgrade. Follow the B110 for your risk assessment process, but then use the B1119 as your newly updated reference guide to implement those technologies. If you're in engineering, whether it be controls, R&D, or advanced technologies, I would skim through the table of contents and be aware of what's new. If any of them catch your eye, then read up on it, because I'm telling you that you can do more with your safety now than you could before, and this includes more productive enhancing capabilities. And if you're in procurement, I would encourage you to require that your machine builders, integrators, and even your local contractors follow this standard. This will help you bolster standardization throughout the safety designs of your machines. And with that, I wanna thank you for joining me. I hope this was as informative for you as it was for me in making this presentation. And I want to encourage you that if you have any safety projects that you're working on or would like further assistance or uh, with the specific requirements of the ANCB 1119, by all means, reach out to us and we can help you apply them to your application. Or if you would like to talk to us about other safety needs, such as performing risk assessments or uh, doing risk, uh, risk designs, fabrication, installation, validation, we're here to help. And with that said, I think we have just a few minutes for questions. So let's see what we have. Uh, so the first question is, um, is there an order to the hierarchy of controls in each area, such as guards uh, in an area of most effective to least effective? Uh, the short answer is no. <laughs> um, what we have to remember is that this is an application standard 
and so we use the B110 to perform our risk assessment and determine the appropriate uh, risk reduction measure. We then use the application standard, the B1119, to apply that measure. So we don't look at the list as some most effective, least effective. They're just put in, a, in an order in general. We use the B110 to help us in that guidance. Um, is there a different time frame when I, or, or is there a time frame when I need to comply to the new standard? Uh, well, again, the short answer is no. Um, keep in mind that these are voluntary standards. So in theory, you don't need to comply to it at all. It's totally up to you. Um, but it, of course, would help you with your um, defense to OSHA. But the standard does give um, um, some guidance in this area, and they basically say 30 months uh, from the effective date. So when the date of the uh, release of the standard, you have basically two and a half years uh, to comply to that. Um, Another question is, in the U.S., do the safety laws automatically incorporate the latest standards? Um, this is not the case in Ontario, Canada. Uh, no, um, only, uh, again, because these are voluntary standards. Um, so these are not incorporated by reference in OSHA. So it is up to us, it's up to you as an end user or an OEM or manufacturer, whether or not you decide to use a standard. You could write your own sta safety standard if you wanted. Um, it's just that because uh, these are um, widely used in the industry, uh, OSHA looks at them for guidance as well, but it's not necessarily a requirement. Uh, let's see here. Is the standard useful for the end user or mainly geared towards OEM and manufacturers? That's a good question. Um, obviously, being that it is an application standard, um, it guides you on how to implement your risk reduction measures. So I guess in theory, you could look at that um, as being geared to a manufacturer or OEM. Um, but I think what you would have to uh, think about as well is, is your maintenance performing um, uh, safety upgrades or, uh, you know, modifying safeties on machines, because if they are as an end user, then this would obviously benefit you as well. Um, let's see here. I hate dead air. I apologize. I'm, I'm trying to uh, see what we got left. Um, are the annexes re uh, a requirement to be followed? All right, that is a good question because obviously I'm kind of, uh, you know, was heavily pushing the annexes. Um, they are not. Um, they are informative information in the, uh, in the standard. But what I have found personally is that sometimes reading that normative information, it's, it's almost like, uh, you know, legal speak at times. And, and then you go to the explanatory information, just hoping for some nugget of information and it still isn't exactly helping. Um, but the annexes uh, give you visuals, uh, they give you examples. Um, so they're not um, prescriptive. You don't necessarily need to follow them specifically, but it's a, a method of how you could uh, comply with the standard. And that's one reason why I like them. I'm, I'm more of a visual learner or understanding in that manner. Um, so uh, with that, I think we're just about out of time. Um, so I wanna thank you for being part of this presentation today. My apologies that I wasn't able to get to all of your questions, but by all means, please email them to info at grantech.com. And I promise that myself or one of my colleagues will get back to you as soon as possible. And just as a reminder, all registered attendees for today's event will also be emailed a recording of this webinar. So feel free to share that recording with your team or anyone in your network um, that you think might benefit from watching. And with that said, I hope you enjoyed this webinar from Grand Tech and have yourself a great day.